drive around at night because I can't sleep normal hours anymore. I used to, back when I was a teenager. I was always the first one to call it a night. Not early, you understand. But by midnight I was usually out. When my parents died, I was in bed asleep. I got the call to come to the hospital, to identify the bodies, and to pick up my sister Mary. There was no one else to do any of it. Our grandparents on both sides were dead, and our mother's sister Beth was a reoccurring character in many meth-fueled dramas that played out across various parts of the state. Even if I could have found her, I wouldn't have. I was 24 at the time, and I was old enough to take care of an 11-year-old girl. Two years out of college, I had a relatively good job as a shift manager at a large food distribution plant only a few miles from my apartment. The work was dull, and I didn't want to do it forever, but it paid the bills for the time being and gave me the flexibility since I could work out my own schedule for the most part. This last point was a key now. Looking down the hall at the impossibly tiny and shell-shocked little girl sitting in a molded plastic chair next to an older, heavy-set woman, my heart broke a little. She'd never know how much she was going to miss out on. Our parents weren't perfect, of course, but as I'd gotten older, I'd come to realize how great they were. They were caring without being smothering, funny without trying too hard, encouraging without being pushy. Best of all, they believed in us, and not in the willfully blind way that you see some parents do. They knew us, understood us, and pushed us to be the best versions of ourselves that we could be. I realized I still needed to identify them and that I couldn't pull it off. I couldn't see Mary first without having to explain why I had to leave again, so I stopped and turned around, heading back to the nurse's desk and follow the directions down to the coroner's office, adjacent to the morgue. They only made me look at the faces, which weren't badly damaged on the surface other than some dark patches and a spot on my father's face that went down too far where his cheekbone used to be. The cuts and scrapes that were visible had stopped bleeding some time before, and the bodies had been clean, at least above the sheet, below a well. From what I was being told, the car accident had been terrible. How Mary had survived, let alone without anything more than a few bruises, was anyone's guess. After I signed the forms, a squat, clammy man thrust at me with robotic condolences. I went back upstairs to get Mary. She started crying when she saw me, jumping into my arms and hugging me tight. The woman seated next to her eyed me suspiciously. You her brother? She glanced down at a clipboard in her ample lap. Mike? I raised an eyebrow. Julian. She smiled thinly and nodded, and I saw it had been some kind of strange check to see if I was the right person. I already didn't like her. I looked down at Mary. Ready to go? She nodded against my chest, and as I turned to go, the woman stood, her smile gone. Hold on for me, son. There's some things we need to go over. Is there someone else we should call? Your Aunt Beth, maybe? Turning on the woman, I tried without much luck to keep the anger out of my voice. She'd been picking Mary for information at a time like this. No, Beth's a junkie, and I don't know where she is. And my parents named me her guardian in their wills. She recoiled slightly, but then she narrowed her gaze slightly and pushed forward. That may well be, son, but we still need to. We don't need to do anything. We need to back off. The first few days were really hard on both of us, but within a few weeks, things started feeling somewhat normal. I had changed my work schedule, so I was always home for when she got out of school until I dropped her back off the next morning. I saved some money up, and by the time summer came, she was able to go to a day camp on the days that I worked. Mary always had friends, but she made a couple new ones at the camp that lived just a few blocks away. I went to her school in the grade below her. I didn't know what a little girl's life was supposed to look like, but Mary seemed like it was getting closer to it anyhow. She was going to the movies, hanging out, having sleepovers. 
It was taking time, but things were going good again. Then I got a call a little after eight one night when Mary was at a slumber party. The mother, Anne or something, said that Mary's nose was bleeding and wouldn't stop. The edge of panic in the woman's voice told me it was bad. I got there and took her to the hospital in less than 20 minutes. And less than 24 hours later, we knew she had a brain tumor. Very lethal and inoperable. It went quickly. Less than two months later, she was dead. Only a few weeks before her 13th birthday. I felt some anger and some sadness to be sure, but mainly I felt scooped out. I went through the motions of living, but I didn't really think about what I was doing. I didn't think about anything. And I didn't sleep very much anymore. So I started driving at night. I lived an hour from what most people would consider the edge of the desert, but I wound up going there most nights. The lack of people and lights. The lack of noise and reminders of people living lives. It helped somewhat. Most nights I'd be back home by four, collapsing into a fitful sleep for a few hours before getting up to go to work, but there were times I'd stay and watch the sunrise climb past the edge of the world, turning everything the color of fire. The thought of that fire comforted me in some strange way. I also started spending more time on the internet, looking for hobbies and things to read, anything to occupy my thoughts for a little bit. There's so many odd corners online, and as time went on, I started delving deeper and deeper into the pockets of esoteric groups. Conspiracy theorists, occultists, UFOologists, you name it. Most of them seem sadly desperate to me, as though they wanted something to believe in and were just grasping for whatever lay close at hand, just needing a lifeline. None of it stuck with me much, and after a few months I'd given up on it almost entirely, I found my lifeline on the roads and the radio. As much as I didn't want to see people, I oddly developed a habit of listening to the radio when I was driving. What didn't matter that much, though I found myself gravitating more and more to the late night talk radio as time went on. There is a surprisingly large overlap between radio crazies and internet crazies, and something about that was strangely comforting. It was one night in late August, nearly 18 months since Mary had died that I first heard the woman's voice on the radio. I was tuning the dial idly, knowing there was at least 30 minutes before the next good talk show was on, when suddenly out of the static I heard a woman speaking. Her voice caught me before I really heard what she was saying. It was raw with emotion, some combination of terror and desperate sadness that hit me hard. I don't know how long, but I hope someone can hear this. Please. Please, if you do, I don't know. The signal faded out and didn't return. After another few moments of driving, I stopped and turned around, trying to find the signal again. No luck. I went back and forth a few more times, but nothing. I couldn't sleep when I got home. Over the next few days, I couldn't get the thought of the strange transmission out of my head. Reason told me that it was nothing either part of a movie commercial or radio play or something equally benign and boring, but I didn't really believe that. It sounded too real. Or maybe I just wanted to believe in it because it was a mystery, a distraction. I enjoyed driving around at night, roaming the desert roads, but it was in a detached way. It was a form of therapy and it did help some, but it never brought me real joy or excitement. This didn't either, not exactly, but going out that night was still the first time I'd looked forward to anything since Mary died. I'd done research during my lunch break on my phone, trying to figure out how far away that broadcast could have come from, and it was disheartening. I knew I was on the FM dial when I heard the transmission because I remembered some of the stations I'd passed, and according to what I'd read, while FM signals didn't typically travel as far as AM and relied on more line-of-sight reception, they could still be broadcast 60 to 100 miles depending on the location and power of the source, and depending on the occasional atmospheric events. Some signals would get bounced way further in time, even from another part of the world. But I didn't think that was the case. It didn't feel right in the 
woman had sounded American with a strong accent that stood out to me. But it, that was still a lot of ground to cover. I started to get down again, at the realization that I was unlikely to ever know where that voice had come from or what it meant, if anything. But still, I didn't have anything else better to do. And if I wanted to spend a few nights listening out for it, what was the harm? Thinking about the best way to do it, I could feel my anticipation growing again. After work, I went to the bookstore and found a book of maps that covered a thousand square miles of the region. The maps in the front were big and more general, but as one went deeper in, they zoomed in more and more on the bigger roads and towns, while also filling in some geologic and historical points of interest that lay in the vast brown and gray seas of desert, lapping at the edges of every highway and country road. I ran home and spread open the map book, trying to figure out exactly where I'd been when I first heard the woman. I'd grown familiar with those roads in the last few months, but I was still hard to say. Driving aimlessly like that through the dark, tired and not paying attention, and then having your attention awoken by a strange voice on the radio. It didn't exactly foster the best recall of landmarks and mile markers. Still, I was pretty sure of the road I was on, and I could narrow the stretch to probably a 30 mile span, but I still had no way of knowing how close or far I was from the source, so I had to assume up to 100 miles in every direction so over 200 square miles. It was a lot. I used a ruler and pencil to draw the distance on one kind of map, uh, midway through the book. Even out in the desert, that kind of area covered five small towns, the edge of two medium-sized cities and nearly 50 roads. On the one hand, it was daunting. At the same time, the complexity of it, of those driving routes, keeping track of where I'd been and still needed to go, all while searching for some elusive signal. It was appealing in a strange way, so I headed out. Deciding to start with that same stretch of road, I'd alternate driving and pulling off for a bit, rolling the dial back and forth, ears pricked for any sign of the woman's voice. But there was nothing. Just the standard stuff and the dim crackle of static in between. After a couple nights of this, I started expanding the search, going further and further out from that center point each night. But it was a slow process. The roads didn't conform to my desire for an organized grid search, and even with the large gaps that keeping the roads led to, after a week I was only 50 miles away from where I had started. I wasn't discouraged exactly, I still looked forward to going out every night. But I did think another angle might be helpful, so I started trying to think of ways to figure out what the signal could be. It started with a commercial idea. I took a couple nights off from writing and combed the internet for any currently playing ads or descriptions for movies or TV shows that might be compatible with what the woman was saying. There were a few potentials, but nothing that panned out. Then it occurred to me that I knew someone who listened to the radio as much as I did. Ricky was in his late fifties and could generously be considered a functioning alcoholic. He was a line manager at the plant, and while he was only semi-reliable as an employee, he was a warm and likable guy. He'd been one of the first people to talk to me when I went to work at the center, and one of the very few people that continued to be friendly once I got promoted. Despite his age, Ricky was always off doing something on the weekend, and he had a myriad of hobbies. One of them was listening to talk radio at all hours of the night. I went to him when he was on lunch break, and he grinned when he saw me. What are you up to, Cap? Come to give me a raise? I laughed. I can't give raises. And why would I give you one? Hard work and ingenuity, man. I'm always thinking about the company. He gave me a smirk and a wink. I'll pass it along. You got a second? He chuckled and gave a nod. I told him about being out driving and hearing the voice. I didn't tell him I kept going back out there. I tried to make it sound very casual, just wondering if he'd ever heard anything like that. When he said no, I told him about the internet research I'd done to make sure it wasn't just a commercial. He nodded again, more thoughtfully, clearly more interested now. Hmm. Have you ever heard of number stations? 
I shook my head. He smiled and continued. They're weird, basically, at different points in time since people have had radios. There are these strange stations that'll pop up. Sometimes briefly. Sometimes for years. They'll play strange music or strings or numbers being repeated. Hence, the name. Weird. Where do they come from? A lot of them are suspected to be a way to send encoded messages. Some old-school espionage. But some of them, no one knows. And people have tried to triangulate where the signal's coming from. But it'll move on them when they get close. Real spooky stuff. <laughs> I haven't heard of anything exactly like what you're describing, but there's definitely some weird stuff on the radio from time to time. Ricky smiled expansively, proud to show off his obscure knowledge. A search of the internet told me Ricky was telling the truth. I wasn't sure how I'd ever heard about the phenomenon during my days of surfing the strange back alleys of the web, but I also wasn't sure how the information that existed helped me. This seemed different than most accounts I read. And again, I couldn't even rule out it was a one-time fluke transmission out of something boring and innocent. I went back out again that night, but I could feel my enthusiasm waning. Then I heard the voice again. <laughs> 